Good morning and welcome to our joint service this morning where we're going to be looking at the theme of priorities. But let's worship God first of all and we'll say together our call to worship. It's based on words from Hebrews 13. We should always praise God because of what Jesus has done for us. We should say clearly that we trust Jesus. That is like our sacrifice of praise, which we offer to God all the time. Let's sing our first song, Jesus is the name we honour. Good morning. Um, I hope you've all got the Pericut Northcott's intimations. There are three things I want to bring to your attention today. The first one is that we are doing a fundraiser. Uh, Bob Somerville has um, got a quiz that is two pounds a sheet and there's even a prize at the end of it if you get them all correct. So please see Bob. (laughs) Okay, the first one to pick out after they're all correct. And um, it's shoebox time. Jim has had, um, he's got the leaflets this morning, so it's time to look out your shoebox and um, get from Jim what needs to go in it and fill them. He's hoping to make 50 this year, so let's try and make that happen. And Fun With Flowers starts again tomorrow, so any new member of the congregation, a new member of Pennycook, are welcome to come along and they'll be made most welcome and have some fun trying to do flower arrangements. But we are also um, holding a flower festival on Saturday the 28th of September to celebrate harvest. Tickets are available from Irene Young or any of the members of Fun With Flowers. They cost £5 and tea and coffee is also available at the in the back hall. Um, And I'd like now to hand over to Catherine who has something to say to us this morning. The Saturday cafe that I was running over the holidays has now finished Um, but I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who's come along to the cafe Um, and a big thank you to everyone who's helped out in the cafe and donated baking because it wouldn't have been possible without you Um, after all expenses are taken into account the cafe raised the sum of £405.63 and And this money will be split between the Pennycook Northkirk food store uh, getting £150, Food Facts Friends getting £150, and the Pennycook Northkirk General Fund. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be here again, worshipping together, and we're looking forward to our service this morning. You'll all have received the Trinity Community Church uh, notices and I'd just like to say that anybody is welcome to come along to anything that you see here or things that aren't advertised in this week's notice either. It's good to, you know, just do things together, not just on a Sunday morning. And there are things, two things in particular this week. Tonight there's a prayer gathering and we're focusing mainly on young people in Pennycook and would really welcome anyone who has an interest and a heart for young people to come along. You don't have to stay for the whole evening. You'll hear more about it from Andrew who's going to speak to us later. And also this week we have the new session of the Guild and it starts tomorrow and again anyone is welcome to come along. And it's not just for women, it's the guild for men and women. (laughs) That's good, Martin. We might see you there. Thank you. But let's now approach God in prayer. Let us pray. Father, you are our gracious and loving Heavenly Father. We're told in Scripture by the Apostle Paul in Romans, not to think of ourselves more highly than we should, but come to a sensible, accurate judgment. 
we confess that we've sometimes been so sure of our own importance and wisdom that we've not valued others as they deserve, looking down on them and close to the contribution they can make. Lord, in your mercy, show us ourselves and by your Holy Spirit lead us to change our minds to truly repent. Father, we also confess that we've sometimes not valued ourselves as we should, underestimating our capacity to serve you and others and failing to appreciate the gifts that you've given us. We've compared ourselves with others and maybe felt worthless and inadequate as a result. Lord, in your mercy, show us ourselves and by your Holy Spirit, lead us to change our minds, to truly repent. Father, we thank you that your mercy is unending. You forgive all who come to you in honest, in honest confession of their sin. And we bless you that you value each one of us giving the same undeserved kindness, the same grace to all who believe. Teach us what it means to live truly in Christian community with each other. Teach us what it means how to walk in the light together with you so that we might share together in that life that you freely give and that we might know by faith the blood of Jesus, your Son, keeping on cleansing us from all our sin. We're bold to pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Strengthen us through the trials of temptation and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. Uh, and thanks just for this opportunity uh, to chat to you um, about TYDG, which is basically the, the Tuesday Youth Group, uh, the Bible Study Group. Um, just to give you a bit of context of what this is about, uh, last year we started a, a Youth Alpha, and that actually went really well. Now, I'm going to ask, uh, uh, could you put it to the first slide? Thanks. So last year we had the, the Youth Alpha, which basically went up to around about Christmas time. And that seemed to go really, really well with the young folk that were there, which was great. And uh, we asked the young people if they'd like to carry on uh, doing something after that. We did, didn't want it just to be the Alpha group. We, we wanted it to be something else that could go on with more teaching for the young folk. Uh, so, at the beginning of the year, uh, we started uh, the Lord's Prayer. It was like a 10-week course that we did, and it was a, a video set by Pete Gregg, and he heads up the 24-7 prayer organization. Uh, so, hopefully, we, 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 hope, we hope that that actually was quite useful uh, for the young people, just to think about what the, Lord prayer, the Lord's Prayer really means to them. Um, but at the same time, it was great just being able to build up relationships with the young folk. Here at the North Church, you've got some great young people. You really have. I mean, they're, they're a real testament to you. And they played quite a major part in the number of people that came along to the group. And it was really brilliant getting to know them. So once we finished that, we weren't quite sure what to do. Uh, so uh, we knew that the exams were coming up and uh, the young folk were 
quite stressed out, obviously trying to study for exams, and there was various other, th- various other things going on. So uh, we asked them if they'd like us to make it just a, an open night on a Tuesday where they could come along, uh, just have a chat, just chill out, play some games if they wanted, uh, eat, which they enjoy doing, they, they do enjoy eating, um, and really just to get to know them and keep on building up that friendship with them uh, so that they knew that, that they had us supporting them as well with those quite major things that they were having to face. So uh, that was basically what we did. Uh, I was just having a look online just to see the number of young people that attend the schools. Uh, so there you go, if you see b there's approximately 718 young people. At Penny High, approximately 622. There's very few of them actually in church, and that's for a variety of reasons. Um, a, lot of, a lot of young people would just feel that it was totally, totally irrelevant, really. And, and in some way you can actually understand how they feel, because if you look at today's world, it's quite different. It's so fast-paced that uh, young people are, are caught up in so many things. I think now young people have got much more of a pressure on them. Certainly when I was younger, uh, when I was at school, um, it, it, it's really quite difficult for, for, for young people these days. So we decided what we would do, uh, this is what we're going to start doing uh, this session. Uh, it's called Duty and it's actually produced by uh, SU in England and hopefully you can uh, see what it says there if you can't it's really uh, to allow young people to explore who they are as people where they fit in uh, what God needs to them uh, how God can actually be their friend and basically have that faith that's going to follow them throughout their life, hopefully. Uh, so it's very uh, relational in terms of the fact that uh, we want it to be a safe place where young people can come, that they can feel at home, they can feel relaxed, uh, they're not going to feel out of place, there's going to be no pressure on them. I mean, essentially what we're doing is we're carrying on what we started um, and hopefully we're going to be able to try and encourage more young people to come along. Uh, we do have two SU groups now, one at B Slack and one at Penny High, uh, but we really need an awful lot of prayer for that, especially the, the SU at, at Penny Creek High. The two teachers that were helping us last year, they, they were really fantastic teachers and they were Christians which was really helpful but sadly the pressures of the work for them they've actually resigned which is really sad so we're actually looking for somebody else to come in and help us at that group uh, but we're hoping to start that up this Wednesday uh, which will be the day after we start uh, rooted with the young folk so we're hoping to try and encourage people, if there are people that come along to this issue, we're going to try and encourage them that they'll come along to root it. Uh, and we'll, we'll just see how that goes. So apart from just Anne and I at our house, we've now got uh, Susan Wong helping us. She very uh, kindly asked earlier on in the year that she could possibly be involved with us. So I think that is going to be really good. I, th- I think she'll be a real asset. To, uh, to the group when we meet. Uh, can we get the next slide to include? So, where do you come in? There is, there is sometimes a bit of a, a, a strange feeling for people that are older to think, well, you know, why are we concentrating so much on the young people? Um, they have everything that they need, but they don't. Young people have so much that they need to try and find out and you as an older person this is your opportunity to be able to get alongside young people now we're hoping that if 
they do get a lot more young people coming along who've never had the experience of church, if they decide to pop along, what kind of experience are they going to have? They've obviously got the, uh, the young Kirk, which is great, and that, that's brilliant. But there's all of you out there as well. It's quite scary for a, a, a teenager to come in. Well, it's quite scary for anybody new to come into a church. Uh, but predominantly, if you're young, uh, that can be quite hard. So it's a great opportunity for older people to actually chat and get to know young people and uh, build up friendships. Um, and you have a, a vast amount of experience that you can help young people with. So that's one thing that you can do. The, the main thing we really need is for people to be praying uh, for the young people in Pennypoot, for the young people in the church. Uh, I started SU last year, and I have to admit, I found it really scary going into the high school. Um, I really take my hat off to the young people, particularly young people that are Christians in school, uh, to be able to take that stand in an environment which is sometimes quite hostile towards Christianity. Uh, so th those young folk really need our support. They, they need people to be trained for them uh, in, in a big way, uh, because they are our future, and uh, God wants young people to be able to, to know him and to have a relationship with him. So prayer is a big thing. Uh, uh, pray for the young people. It's maybe going to take a bit more time coming in. But the next one, I know we have a list here. It, it's great on a Tuesday night we have people to help uh, maybe provide food and uh, help out that way. And I know that you have a list here uh, in the North Church for people to sign up to do that. We're hoping that we'll have the same sort of list uh, in Trinity Church as well and uh, other churches where, where, where people maybe want to support that way. So if you'd like to do that, um, if you have a word with Anne, um, sorry, go back to the prayer first. Sorry, I'm getting a bit mixed up here. If you go back to the prayer first, we have a WhatsApp group uh, which people can sign up to and that will keep you informed of everything that's going on with the young people and it gives you a basis to be able to pray for specific things, specific needs, and specific things for, for young folk. Uh, the second one, the practical one, about actually uh, maybe being able to provide food or something like that, again, if you have a word with, with Anne, if you haven't signed a, a list here and you'd like to do that or you feel that's something that you could do, um, have a word with Anne, she has a, a list as well where we can take names to do that. And uh, what have we got next? Yes, we've got that one. If you, I mean, if you're not any good at cooking or you maybe would like to do something but you maybe just want to give some sort of donation, that helps us to be able to keep uh, buying in supplies to keep the young folk going. Um, what we're really hoping, our vision, <coughs> we don't have a particularly big house, as our young folk know, so, um, you know, it tends, it's great, but sometimes it can be like standard room only. So, what our vision is to actually be able to move out from our church, but go into uh, an environment somewhere, uh, in the hall, hopefully, uh, along at uh, Trinity Church, and set up there a way that young folk would like it to look. Not just for young folk, but for, for everybody. And we can possibly be there. So that's our long-term vision. It just depends how many start to come again on Tuesday night and how they get on NSU. So that picture, very important. You're never, ever too old to be involved with young people. That's something that... Uh, I've learned over the years, uh, some of the people that I've met in church who uh, are great, you know, they, they, they maybe can't run around or do all these different things, but they, they just take time to uh, invest in, in young people and support them and be a friend to them. Some of the kids that are in the school, they don't have uh, grandparents, they maybe don't have uh, parents who give them that kind of love and support and attention. 
and that's a great thing that we can do in the church for young people to come along. So, you're never too old. Again, it's already Margaret mentioned it, but about the prayer meeting tonight, if you'd like to come along, we're praying specifically for uh, the work in the schools and for all the young folk. Uh, and we'd love it if as many people could come along to the prayer meeting tonight uh, just, just to do that. If, they, if you can make it, that would be great. And I think the last slide that I did put up again about SU, uh, they really need our, our prayers. Uh, they do a fantastic work, and it, we really want to be able to see that working well in the schools. And again, to pray for the protection for the, the, the young people that, that, that come along to these groups, uh, that there would be no ridicule or anything that, that can really put them off. And I speak from experience, because when I was at high school, they had an SU group. I wasn't a Christian at that time. I used to think everybody that went to SU were completely crazy. And I would have been one of the people that would have given folk a hard time. And I really sorely regret that now. Because you never know how God's going to work. So, if you can pray, if, if nothing else, please, please pray for our young people. And uh, pray for the start on, on Tuesday night for this group. Pray for your... Uh, the group that meets here for, for Young Kirk. It, it's, it's a great work that has been uh, actually done with those young people. So, thank you very much. We're now going to sing again. And just to remind the, the Young Kirk that it's, it's time to leave after this. We're going to sing what Andrew's been saying. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Our first reading this morning is from Titus chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. As for you, Titus, promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. Teach the older men to exercise self-control to be worthy of respect and to live wisely. They must have sound faith and be filled with love and patience. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children to live wisely and be pure, to work in their homes, to do good, and to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. In the same way, encourage the young men to live wisely, and you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and the seriousness of your teaching. Teach the truth so that their teaching can't be criticized. Then those who oppose us will be ashamed and have nothing bad to say about us. Our second reading is from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all commands I have given you, and be sure of it. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Irene. Good morning. Great to see everybody. And uh, welcome to those who are not regular at the uh, PNK. It's great to have you with us and worshipping with us 
and uh, <coughs> aren't the band awesome? Especially the drummer. Let's. Yeah, <laughs> what did he say? That'll be right. <laughs> Okie dokie, let's, let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your love and your kindness, your mercy and your grace. We thank you for your word to us, which reveals Jesus to us in deeper and deeper ways. Thank, thank you for the way that it is active and present in us. And it's not just static words on a page, but it goes deep into us, dwells richly in us. And may it do so. May, as we come to your words this morning, may my words fade away, but your word to us remain. May it produce fruit in our lives that gives glory to you and shows the way of salvation to those who are lost. Amen. I have to confess, I found this was quite a difficult subject to write on, not because... Um, the topic was specifically challenging or hard or unusual or new, um, but really because the chapter in the book wasn't a lot of help. Mostly because it presented its argument in a way of a bunch of statistics and a few anecdotes about the experience of various churches around. But there wasn't a lot of Bible in it. I mean, there was a fair bit, but not a huge amount. And so it's a difficult thing to work on. Also, how do you talk about prioritizing one group without seeming like you're suggesting neglecting other groups? Which, of course, is not what is being suggested at all. So as I reflected on this section as a whole, it occurred to me that instead of thinking about growing young and thinking about how do we engage really with just young people, we should be thinking about growing intergenerationally which is of course the type of communities we see in the Bible isn't it intergenerational communities families even that command that, the, uh, that Jesus gives us they go into all, all the world and make disciples of all nations yeah well the word nations there of course is a, a good English word and it comes out of a historical context that we're familiar with, the sort of nation-state idea. Um, but the word actually means tribe, or family, or people, people groups. It's not about government, it's about people. Go into all people, make disciples of all people. And probably, of course, many of us grew up in these type of churches, intergenerational churches. Who remembers the time of churches with massive Sunday schools? I mean, it's great to see so many young folk go out uh, earlier, but who remembers when there was 50 or 100 in the Sunday school? Yay! Who went on great Sunday school trips to Whitby or wherever? Skegness. Or young mums groups which were busting at the seams. You couldn't get in for all the prams and people. A well attended boys brigade. Or Bible class. And a strong, a really strong youth presence. Who remember those glory days? Many of us remember those glory days. And we had a strong demographic of people, didn't we? We had young folks, we had old folks, we had folks in between. And it was great. And I do know that, sorry, maybe we were at that time those very youth that were in the youth groups or the BBs, or at least the young adults. When I think back to when Eunice and I were, were young whippersnappers in, uh, in a church in Edinburgh, we were the young people. Now I know that most, if not all, the churches in Pennycook have had a strong intergenerational focus. I know that we've had a much wider demographic. So it begs the question, what happened? What happened? Well, first of all, this is common to all the churches in the country. At least most of the churches, whatever our tradition, however uh, young or old we might be, uh, everyone has this problem. 
I remember going to Klan a few years ago now. Klan is, uh, was a charismatic um, sort of conference that happened in Scotland. Uh, it was very good and well, lament its demise, but uh, it was an excellent thing. Um, in the day, I remember standing in the congregation looking about and looking at the number of gray heads, gray hairs and bald heads, just like mine. I'm thinking, where are all the young people? Well, they had a youth tent, but that wasn't huge. Where are they? What's happening to the church in our nation, not just us? Because this is common to most churches in the West. And, you know, I feel that I have to make some probably quite uncomfortable suggestions as to why this would be. So brace yourself. First off, I think that for the most part, as a church, countrywide, any church, younger or older, no matter, I think we've often lost sight of our primary call. We've lost sight of our call to make disciples. Sure, we maintain the church, we run the business of the institution, we're really good at our committees and, and all of that stuff, getting volunteers to do administrative tasks, which are really important, that's great, and we're good at that. But you know what, we often shy away from outreach, don't we? How many of us, when we say, well, we're going to go and have a, a door-knocking weekend and we're going to visit a whole bunch of folk, go, yeah, that's my thing. I really want to do that. Or go, no, nah, that's for somebody else. I can't walk that far. Or I'm just too shy to knock on someone's door and ask them something. Talk to them. How many of us jumped at the chance when uh, or, or our hearts leapt with joy as uh, Andrew shared about working with, with schools. So, yes, I really want to go into the schools and help with that. Or did we go, no, that's not for me. That's not my thing. You know, our outreach is not something which is comfortable. But it shouldn't be doing things that are just comfortable. It should be doing things that Jesus tells us to. And even if we do hold to that, we often behave as though making disciples is about Bible teaching and Christian ethics taught in a classroom, in a formal setting. In other words, we educate and we teach people how to follow the rules better. And when we become good rule followers, then we get to do the stuff. We get to serve in a particular way. We maybe get to join session. Oh, that's exciting. Or play in the band, or whatever it might be. But we've got to learn, we've got to prove ourselves. And the problem is that proving ourselves is not very inspiring. And we live in a culture which increasingly does not want to prove itself. Feels that somehow it's okay to just do whatever you think. Be all you can do, and all that stuff. Feeling we have to prove ourselves and conform does not easily motivate. But is there another way to, to police the system, make sure that folks carry our heart, our DNA, carry the vision, and make sure that folks are sufficient Christian character without feeling they have to prove themselves? How do we encourage folk and yet make sure that they're still sufficiently mature? I'm sure John can testify this too, but I've had my fair share of troublemakers who have seemed to be a good fit, and you invite them to serve in a particular thing, and suddenly they're a nightmare. They take hold of it, they own it, it's theirs, they're not teachable, they're not flexible, they're rebellious, and they start being difficult, and it's just awful, because their Christian character is insufficiently mature. You've got to judge. You've got to be able to assess. So how do we make sure folks are being their very best selves while still being teachable? Carrying the heart and not just going off doing their own thing. Okay? That's hard. So on the one hand, 
There's this, on the other hand, there's that. Secondly, I suggest that our model of pastoral care is imbalanced, and it has been for many centuries. So there's an American theologian called Walter Brueggemann, and Walter writes that over the centuries we've adopted a practice of pastoral care that is primarily about helping those in need. Is that how we see pastoral care? How many people see pastoral care that way? Helping those in need. Maybe it involves counseling. Someone's got a, uh, an issue, we need some counseling. And he suggests that while this is good and, and has plenty of biblical examples, which of course it does, does there's a, a definite preference for the poor and the needy in the Bible. We see that and we shouldn't ignore that. That focus of pastoral care in that way is fundamentally derived from Greek Stoicism. Not necessarily biblical. It doesn't make it wrong, it just means it's not biblical. Pastoral care, as Jesus' example said, and we see it throughout the scriptures, is more about growing us up in Christ. It's about developing Christ likeness. To look to Christ as our source of help, to look to Christ as the one who answers our prayers gives guidance, strengthens, heals. To look to Jesus as the one who we are to be like and develop that nature in us. So the focus is not on us and our efforts as the caregiver or provider or counselor or whatever, but primarily on Christ. We are the signposts that point to Christ. In other words, pastoral care is discipleship making disciples. And this is what we see Paul writing about to Titus in what is evidently an intergenerational context. He's talking about young men and old men, young women and old women. Now, we may find that what he's saying to them is somewhat culturally located. But he's, the church he's talking to is intergenerational. When we take our focus off making disciples, the church suffers. It is our primary job. It's what Jesus tells us to do before he leaves. Incidentally, he also tells us, or at least he tells Peter, and it's in the book, so it must be for all of us, I will build my church. Remember the passage? I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus builds the church. We make disciples. The thing is that over the years, we've got it topsy-turvy. We think we have to build the church. We can't with programs and structures and laws. Good grief, the, uh, the Presbyterian church is full of laws. There's a whole website full of them. And lots of cross-references, if you care to look. Um, so... You know, we're really good at building institutions and structures, but that's not what Jesus told us to do. He told us to make disciples. You make disciples, the church grows. That's how it works. So the question is, how do we do that? How do we make disciples? It was lovely to hear the work that Andrew and Anne and uh, Susan are doing and all the others that are helping out in the school great. Make disciples. See, this is where I think the growing young section that I said wasn't that helpful actually becomes helpful. Because it involves all of us. And there are pains to say it involves all of us. Just as Paul writes to Titus. In his book Exclusion and Embrace, the Serbian theologian Miroslav Volf talks about handling difference. Because there is a difference from someone who is in their teens to someone who is in their 60s, 70s, 80s. We're just different. And he tells us this really important thing. He says, he says, when we assert our perceived needs and rights and say, this is what I want, it always, always encroaches on the perceived needs and rights of others. It's like a bunch of balloons in a box trying to find space. 
When we push, someone has to give. That's how it works. And that, of course, causes conflict or exclusion. He suggests that rather than push and pull in that way, we need to learn to embrace the needs of another, to willingly offer space, to give up space, to honor the needs of another out of love. And that's a sacrificial thing to do. It's a hard thing to do. But it does demonstrate love and acceptance on a powerful, powerful level. It says, you are welcome. You're welcome in my space. Now, it's easy to say, laudable to aspire to, but when you get down to the practicalities, it becomes more difficult. We can talk about it, but what about when we have to actually do it? Too often, we want to keep a hold of our little domains and fiefdoms, don't we? The things we enjoy. I love playing drums. If someone who was a, uh, someone else came along and says, I'm, I'm a drummer, I'd like to drum. If they were better than me, that would be intimidating. If they were terrible, it would be hard to deal with because, you know, there's, how do you deal with that kindly? The Growing Young material argues that each of these things that we like doing, each of these speakers, we need to hold these things lightly. And maybe even give these things up and allow others to take up the mantle. True discipleship is allowing others to serve and grow even in areas that we would rather hold on to. Maybe we've been doing Young Kirk for the last 70 years and we don't want to give that up. But someone comes along who is full of zeal and enthusiasm and gifted and can do that. Do we give them space? Or do we hold on? Or do we give them space and then try and micromanage them? I've seen that happen. Ah, wouldn't they do that way? That's not the way we did it before. We've got to learn to give up and to trust with responsibility as we do so. To give space to embrace rather than exclude. In practical ways, that might mean something like operating the sound desk, or running a cafe, or taking part in worship, as in doing the readings, or uh, doing the prayer. Might be serving on session, or on a session committee, or on session itself. How many of us became elders in our 20s? Not many. Wow, surprising. There are a goodly number um, around that have come become elders in their twenties. Would we be prepared to allow that to have representation of the whole church, including our older young people? I'm not talking about having children, but you know, our older teenagers and twenties having a representation in the governance of the church. I think that's important. I don't just think it's a kind thing to do. I think it's important. And we need to make space for that. Now many of these things we're already doing. I mean, Eric's on the desk there, you know, and he's a young person. Are you a young person, Eric? Yeah, yeah. Jim's a young person too, but uh, just has a few more years under his belt. Many of these things, thing, many of these things we've been doing already. We already heard uh, Catherine telling us about the cafe she ran, etc. But can we do more? Can we do more? Can we let go more? What about when someone comes with a vision or a, an idea? Where Andrew was talking about young people getting together. Um, what about church property is a premium resort, isn't it? The rooms that we have they're important. What about giving over a room to young people to use as they will, whether it's for hanging out, 
whether it's for Bible study, whether it's for music, whether it's for a variety of things, but we just let them have the room. Decorate it as you will. We'll give you some money to do that annually. Because these things change as fashions change. And we'll support that. Rather than saying, this room's for this. And we'll just keep it here. And we'll not use it for anything. Apart from this thing. For an hour a week or whatever. And we all have rooms like that in our building. We need to let that go. And let it change. What about 24-7 prayer? Someone says, I like to do 24-7 prayer. Well, you'll not get anybody for that. I you do, actually. It's easier to fill the night than the day, it has to be said. If we wanted to do 24-7 prayer, and I mean, you know, not just try it for a couple of weeks, but do it for a year, it would build up, there would be down spaces. And are we prepared to give over a room for that? To decorate it and provide resources in there for that to happen? Give space for the vision of someone else? Even if we don't agree with it, even if we think it's silly, or impossible, or unachievable. What about allowing suitably gifted young people to bring a sermon? Yeah, there might be training needed, there might be support and such like, but are we prepared to, to do that? I'm prepared to do that as a minister. I do that anyway, it's part of the, my, one of my roles in church. But are we prepared to accept that? Or lead worship, by which I mean the music. Or lead in a prayer ministry team for folks who pray for folks at the end of services, if we have that. Or prepare the flowers unsupervised, without joining fun with flowers beforehand to learn how to do it properly. Are we prepared to do that? For someone who has a gift in art and crafts and, and, and beauty? Are we prepared to give space for things we don't necessarily like or agree with? John sent me a video earlier this week as he was, as I was thinking this over, because it is a lot. And the fellow was referring to the usual sort of social stuff about Gen X, Gen Y, and blah blah blah, uh, which we may not find helpful. Um, I think reasonably helpful, but still. Uh, but he did make a point which I thought was really, really important, and that was this: most people born after 1997, i.e. those who are now approaching 30, so not young, young people, have never known a life without the internet. Never. And as they got older, they've never known a life without social media. And it was explaining, and I, I didn't realize this, which shows you how out of touch I am, that there's a difference between Facebook and TikTok. And the difference is this. Facebook links you with your friends. You have to give permission to your friends. And then they can see what you're doing. Oh, okay, their friends can see it too, if you allow that. But it's about friends linking friends. TikTok is an algorithm. We think you like this. There you go. It's like the, you know, we will send you advertising. We think you like. Click here for the cookie. It's that kind of thing. It's a different system. And we've moved from a, a Facebook generation to a TikTok generation. It's just different. Now this is important because that huge demographic of young people, anyone under 30, which let's face it, is massive, tend to engage primarily through this medium. They don't engage through newspapers or magazines, or local info rags, or even television. They don't trust television, because they know the legacy media lies. It's not trustworthy any more than anything else. I had a discussion with a session clerk way back in the day about, you know, he was obsessed with putting things in the local, he, oh, people see it in the local paper. No one ever read the local paper. But they did in the 50s and the 60s. And today, there's a whole generation of folk that they will never touch if that's all we do. How do we engage with that mission field in a meaningful and effective way? Do we try to be all things to everyone and become 
focus our efforts on that particular area and not do the other thing? Do we try and learn how to do it meaningfully? Or do we allow young people to take the reins? Because in all likelihood, they know what we're doing more than we ever could. I know it's after 12, so excuse me, I'm almost done. See, that's a challenge to me because back in the day I ran a company that worked in this media. I should know what I'm talking about. I've got a, a, an advanced degree in it. I know the tech, or at least I used to. My knowledge is 30 years old. Am I prepared to let that go? Now I realize that the passage we, passages we read talk about uh, older and more mature Christians teaching younger ones how to do this stuff. Because, you know, old men teach the young men how to do whatever. And young women, older women, teach the younger women how to do their list of things. But this teaching was never meant to be in a classroom. He's not saying hold a seminar or have an evening where the older women teach the younger women how to love their husbands and love their children. As if you need to be taught how to love your children. But, you know, that's a different sermon. Um, it was never meant to be in a classroom. It was always meant to be in the life, on the job. That's how you do discipleship, on the job. Discipleship is about developing character, not job competence. Prioritizing growing young and giving space for younger folks to serve and grow is discipleship. It's what we're called to do. Help one another grow up in Christ. Help us serve and learn and get it wrong and learn again and do it right eventually. That's discipleship. You only learn when you make mistakes. It needs to be, and these are points from the book, and I think they're really important points, it needs to be more than rhetoric or a contained initiative. Well, you can stop, but it's over here, contained in this little area. This is the youth thing, and this is the grown-up thing. It needs to be a daily reality of active involvement together, giving space, embracing the difference. Young people need to have a load-bearing role in the community, not an isolated role contributing through serving and using their gifts just as Eric is doing just as Samuel does just as Catherine did with the Catherine and I'm sure others in other places and I apologize that I don't remember them all in this, in this top of my head this is not about fancy programs or initiatives it's about a culture change and it takes time to change a culture it's about 10 years. It takes about 10 years to change a culture. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a long, long time. But it's about culture change in our congregations, and that's a challenge. It means prioritizing families. It means actively involving parents, even parents who do not yet come to church as regular worshippers. Because you know what, as their children come and know Jesus, sometimes, in fact, often parents come too. Partly because they want to see what their kids are up to. But the Holy Spirit works in front, works in families. God loves families. Go into all the world and make disciples of all families, people groups. It involves sometimes giving up our own wants or perceived needs for the good of the whole community. And that cuts both ways. Always. Makes John and my job a lot more difficult because how do you maintain balance and, and encourage folks at the same time? But it requires balance. I said at the start that it seems to me that in Pennycook we already have had that level of engagement in many of our churches. 
We've already had healthy intergenerational churches. But you know what? That was decades ago. And I mean decades. And I know we've got a lot of history since then. The challenge today, however, is how do we reach out to the unchurched younger generations? How do we minister to their needs as young people, as families? And how do we make disciples as Jesus commands? Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can give our offerings to you. And we thank you that you've entrusted us with a task to do, to make disciples, to witness to our faith and your name in our communities. Father, help us as we do this. And so as we present our offerings to you, we also present ourselves. Please use us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and tell us what you want us to do. In Jesus' name, Amen. We're now going to sing, Father, I place into your hands. Almighty God, the creator of the universe, the Lord of space and time, we just can't get our heads around your infinite majesty, wisdom and power. What a marvel that you are also our Heavenly Father, that you love each one of us here, that you know each one of us inside out, and that you offer each of us a personal relationship with you here and now. And afterwards, a never-ending life in your amazing presence. We don't know what that will involve, but we do know that it will be even more wonderful than anything we can possibly imagine. So, Father God, thank you. Thank you for that love that reaches out to every one of your children and longs for us to respond. Thank you that when we put our lives into your hands, you promise us peace, joy, and life in all its fullness. And thank you that you keep all your promises all the time. Father God, there are so many people all over your world who desperately need your help, and we bring some of them to you now asking you to meet their needs, especially in situations where, left to ourselves, we just don't have the answers. We remember the millions of people caught up in wars and civil wars throughout Europe, Africa, Asia, and parts of North America. Many of these conflicts go back decades, or even centuries. Father God, we ask you to change hearts so that they come to an end and just settlements can be reached. We pray for the countless numbers of people, mainly in the third world, whose very existence is directly threatened by climate change. Lord God, we ask you, through your Holy Spirit, to change attitudes in the rich and powerful countries, not just among leaders, and politicians, but among ordinary people like ourselves, so that self-interest gives way to an honest desire to do the right thing. And in a world where there are more Christians than ever before, there are also more people than ever before persecuted, imprisoned, and sometimes killed because of their loyalty to you. Lord, we pray for your protection for all your people in vulnerable and dangerous situations and ask that everyone who is suffering for their faith will have your strength and comfort and know your love surrounding them. 
And Father God, we pray too for ourselves, a small community in a small town, in a small country, on the edge of Europe, but still part of your vast worldwide family. You have called us to tell the people around about us here about you in words and in actions and to pass your love on to them. Help us to take on board everything we've heard today so that people of all generations, young, middle-aged and old, can feel comfortable in your church and want to be part of your growing kingdom here. We ask all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Our final song today is Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. Go now in peace to love and serve your community by telling them about the grace which is available in Jesus. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen.